again, thanks for coming out and joining us. Uh, you know, get right into, you know, obviously a little recap of the game on Saturday uh, with Penn State. You know, obviously it was very disappointed um, that, you know, I felt our players played really, really hard. I thought they played with great effort. But as we've talked about in here quite a few weeks, uh, our execution is not the cons at the consistent level that it needs to be when you're competing against teams like Penn State. But again, I'm really proud of the way the guys competed in that game and, um, you know, a few plays here and there and, and the outcome uh, could have been a little different. Um, give credit to Penn State, obviously, for the win. You know, moving into the Michigan State job, uh, Michigan State game, obviously Coach Tucker has done a really good job uh, of getting his team to the point where they're a top 10 ranked team. Um, you know, they, they obviously had a tough loss last week, but when you watch them on tape, uh, that running back they have is a really special player, and they do a great job of utilizing him as he obviously leads the Big Ten and one of the best offenses in, in the Big Ten as well. Uh, when you look at him, he has 1,300 yards rushing, and you know our defensive guys, we chart. And I think he has over 900 yards of yards after contact, which means you know he's one of those guys that you better bring all your pads and all your friends when you tackle him because he's got great contact balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the guy that we've got to try to take out of the game plan this week. Um, you know, Like I said, their quarterback, Peyton Thorns, a, a good player that really has operated really well. I mean, that as much as as much success as the running backs had, they're pretty balanced on offense. And I think, you know, number one, uh, their receiver there is a guy that's made a lot of plays for them. A lot of the plays they make in the passing game comes from their ability to run the football. And so, you know, the play action pass game and the compliments to the run game have really allowed them to be an explosive offense when you watch them. Uh, defensively, you know, they're a team that gets after the quarterback. Number 96, uh, their DN, uh, a really big time player, uh, has a big time motor, fits into the mold of all the great front guys that we faced thus far. So uh, we better understand and know where he is. And, you know, it'll be a great road test for us. Um, it's always tough, as I say, to win on the road, especially in the Big Ten. Um, I do know this our kids will show up. They've showed up every week. They practice the way we need to practice. But now I've got to get them and us as a staff. We've got to get our players to play uh, to the best of their ability this Saturday and uh, give ourselves a chance to, to do something special, which is still to get to that sixth win, which allows us to become bowl eligible. And, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that you know, yesterday's practice, the energy in the meetings and making the corrections from the Penn State game, those things are all there. So that's a good sign for us, a good sign for the culture that we've kind of started to create. And, and I know we'll be able to get things done based off of that. Um, the captains for this game will be Greg Rose, Chigo Quanco, and uh, Jordan Mosley. I guess with that, I'll open it up to questions. Network solutions, managed IT, and technical support. Viner Forgates makes your company work. Hey, Coach. Uh, I noticed that Brandon Jennings didn't play on Saturday, and then he's out on the depth, depth chart this week. Did his uh, like knee issue flare up again, or kind of what's his status? Yeah, you know, he's been kind of day to day practice last week, and then on Thursday, uh, just kind of a setback. You know, we're in the process of trying to figure out, you know, the best kind of brace. You know, the injury he had, you know, has to wear a brace to kind of give it the support necessary. Uh, anything medical is out of my hands. That's why I don't give a lot of information medically because I'm told who's available, who's not, when they can play, when they can't, and, and I make the necessary adjustments. And, and I'm not going to sit here and get into every week who played, didn't play. Uh, he's injured. Uh, he's played a little bit early. We're trying to get the brace thing right for him to have a comfort level to be able to go play. Um, he practiced yesterday. He practiced all last week up until Thursday. It was a late scratch. So. We're hoping that if we can get the brace in in time, he's able to participate fully in practice, see how that thing holds up for him, and see if he'll be able to contribute. But um, with, with the receiver injuries, was there a little bit more of a concerted effort to get the ball into those guys' hands? And how has the development of Corey, in addition to Jake, kind of helped you out in that room? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think the receiver injuries play a part in how we distribute the ball. I mean, we have certain plays and things that we do where if the defense is allowing us to take advantage of certain matchups, we do. And I think that was uh, something consistent that, that happened in the game yesterday, uh, Saturday, 
Little Chig and Corey both playing, you know, a decent role in the game. But, you know, when we have 85, 92 plays like we've had the last few weeks because of us speeding up the tempo, it affords more opportunities. You know, when we have a 55 play game like we had a few weeks ago with the turnovers and us maybe not playing at the tempo, it limits the amount of touches that people can get. And, yeah, that, that allow you to diversify, but you know it wasn't as if we made a conscious effort to say, "Hey, let's get the tight ends the ball," because they're a focal point of what we do. Um, we try to find the best matchups every week, exploit those matchups based on you know who they're going against and you know who their best players are and who their worst players are. And I think we did a pretty good job last week of at least the tight ends being incorporated into it. Mike, you've talked about you know the over the last couple of weeks the penalties, the mistakes. As a coaching staff, how do you guys get rid of those without feeling like you're harping on these kids? Because it, it, it's not like they're trying to make these mistakes. But how do you? What's the, the the fine line for you guys as a coaching staff to kind of I guess grow and encourage this team? Well, I mean, just like I said, I always use the analogy, and you know, you know, if you have kids. How do you get your kids to stop doing dumb things? You just keep reinforcing it. You draw the line in the sand in terms of, you know, these are the standards and how we need to play the game. And if, if possible, there's times where, you know, you don't see guys out there playing as much. Uh, we've made some of those type of changes as well, you know, based on how kids perform, how they play. But I mean, I'm in the business of developing 18 to 22 year old kids. And, you know, they've got a lot of things in their life. They got a lot of things going on obviously on the football field. Uh, discipline is one of the toughest things to say, how do you correct? Well, you correct it by constantly preaching it, constantly showing how it's affect us. Every week I put up a penalty uh, graph that shows the amount of penalties that people have had throughout the course of the week in our league and in the country. Uh, I put a turnover, the, the cost of turnover chart up every Monday we meet and, and our players see you know, the overall record of people in the plus turnover ratio in the Big Ten for the season is like 43 and 8. Well, the guys that are in the negative part of the turnover ratio, their record's like 11 and 43 or something like that. I don't have the correct exact number in front of me, but every Monday we show that, we talk about it. Um, as coaches, we evaluate personnel, we evaluate how guys are playing. If a guy's a guy that's highly penalized, then we can find a way to get another guy in there to reinforce the importance of playing that way, then we'll do it. So. I mean, that's the great magic question. What, what do you do for it at home when the kids aren't doing what you want to put your hands? I mean, what do we do? I just start telling them stories and they don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, let's well, maybe I'll do that. Hey, Coach. Uh, I know going into last week, uh, you mentioned that you wanted to, uh, or you expect the team to continue to run the ball against you guys until you guys proved that you were able to stop it. Um, so, how would you evaluate your, your run defense against Penn State and um, what gives you confidence going up against that matchup against Kenneth Walker? Yeah, I mean, you know, I thought we played the run well against Penn State. You know, we held them to 2.2 yards per rush. But the flip side of it is, is we gave up a bunch of yards in a passing game. So um, I'd like to be a little more balanced on defense to where we stopped the run and the pass. And, uh, but, you know, they were a team, obviously, Kenneth Walker is the guy that makes their offense go. And, you know, if you look at us the last three or four weeks, you know, we went into the Minnesota game and they, we knew they wanted to run the ball. and. We didn't effectively stop them from doing that. Last week, we knew the type of player Jahan Dotson was, and he still had a big game. So for us, uh, for me as the leader, um, our job is to take away their best players and force them to play left-handed or force someone else to beat us. And we've got to do the same thing this week, which will be a tough task because of the type of talent that Kenneth Walker III has, how they utilize him. Um, he's a big-time player, but you know what? I, I, I like our guys and the energy they bring in the run game. And, you know, I think we'll have to, you know, obviously fit our gaps properly. We'll have to do a great job of tackling because when you, like I said, you look at 900 over 900 yards of uh, after contact yardage, uh, that means he runs with great pad level. Um, we've got to do a good job of getting 11 hats to the ball. Coach, the defensive line really stepped up last week for you guys against Penn State. What are some specific things that you saw from that game that you hope to carry over into this game against Michigan State? Yeah, you know, I've said it in here the last few weeks. Our interior D-line, the three dudes, the Ami, the Moes, the Sam Moes, those guys, and we're at three, four front. So very but very few of the big plays that have happened have happened in the A or B gaps. Our C gap is the area that's kind of been exposed when we have been exposed. And, you know, losing players like Darrell Chami and now, you know, and then Deshaun Holt, who 
those type of players kind of, those are starters that are no longer there. And now we've got young players playing it. You know, I like the way that the chop is developing for us as a Sam linebacker. We've gotten some great play out of Lotez Rogers as well as Tyler Baylor here the last few weeks. And so, um, again, hoping that we can hold up in the C area and, and that, that C area, D area, where the ball kind of has really uh, done, you know, where people have had success. I mean, that's where we've got to do a better job there. But the interior part of our defense, uh, those guys do a great job of playing with leverage. They play with a motor. Uh, we get knocked back, you know, when you, you're playing zone teams that like to run the ball. The key is getting pushed in the middle, the A gap and the B gap, and Mo and Sam and Ami and Daryl Jackson and Greg Rose. Uh, even Taze Johnson and those guys have all really contributed and helped us there with that part of it. There's a couple guys that sort of popped to me during that game that showed development. One is Jeremy Spragans at linebacker, which he showed some really good speed. I'd like to hear your comments on how he's developed this year. And the other is Ty Felton, who finally got into the game and, and had a couple big catches. Yeah, you know, he played, I started playing in the Minnesota game, so it's not his first game he's played in, but he's played some significant minutes here as we've lost players down the last few games at the receiver position. It's good to see young players develop like Ty. Um, we know he's very capable or we wouldn't have recruited him. Uh, as I've said at the beginning of the year, our tight, our receiver room is one of the rooms that we've been able to create depth where you see when you lose a player like Dante or, J or Jay Sean, the, the talent level maybe doesn't drop off as quickly. Um, you know, with Worm, it's great to see him. You know, I think for, for him as a junior college player, it takes a little while to get, you know, the speed of the game at this level um, kind of acclimated to it. And what, you, what, I've, what I've seen out of him the last couple of weeks is he's kind of getting acclimated to how we want to play defense. Uh, he was a guy that's very physical. Uh, obviously, with Brandon being out, he's been kind of thrust into playing a lot more. Uh, you know, Rob McCullough has played a bunch in there along with Ruben Hippolyte, but really been happy with the way Worm has progressed uh, in terms of as the season gone along, he's gotten better and better, mm -hmm. starting to have a good understanding of what we want him to do and get accomplished in, in our defensive scheme. Coach, you had, you had uh, Anderson at center and then Blades at right tackle. And I believe, it might, might not be positive, 100% positive here, but I believe that was the first game you guys had the same five in there on basically every meaningful offensive snap uh, at the line. So does that, how does that kind of make you feel moving forward and you know, looking back at the tape, you know, how do you think those five did? You know, again, with Spence, we made the decision to move Spence to center. Um, and, and I said this last week that, uh, you know, Eric, like, like Worm, is a junior college player and that acclimation, he acclimated a lot faster obviously came in and has a really good football intelligence level with him for us on the offensive line. Um, but one of the things we kind of address is that, you know, the interior part of our run and our protection for our quarterback, um, not having that interior in his lap, you know, he's not six foot four. And so being a six foot guy behind center, you'd like to have the true pocket where that firmness is in the A and B gaps and you rush out wide and now he can stay inside the pocket. and. and Moving Spencer inside has helped us shore that up. Um, you know, the other reason behind it is DJ Glaze has been playing at a really high level. We've played him in every game. He started the West Virginia game. We play him, you know, we try to play a bunch of players because of the development of our team. And as we've gotten into the thick of it, he's one of those guys that felt deserving of more playing time. And our goal is to put the best five on the field. With Spencer's versatility, being able to play both tackles and center, um, it, it affords us that luxury, and you know I was pleased with the way that group played. For the most part, I would like to see us kind of establish, as I said again, more balance in the run game, um, and, and we'll continue to work toward that. But you know, going into the year, we had seven guys we thought could we could play and, and have a great chance to win with, and Emilio Moran was one of those other ones. I think he's continued to play some at the guard and tackle position. As we get to the last stretch here, you know, we need that position group to continue to develop from what he had. Mike, Saturday's going to be Talia's 10th start this season. First time people have had 10 starts in a season since you know, back when he was in high school. What's impressed you as far as the plays that he's making now, that the plays that he made last Saturday, as opposed to plays that maybe he might not have been able to make in September just because of lack of comfort in the system? Yeah, you know, I thought he started out really fast for us in September and did some great things. And, and on offense, we showed great diversity. And, 
he protected the ball really well, but then somehow a narrative was created and after the Iowa game, uh, you know, as if there was a propensity for him to turn the ball over. And I mean, to me, I said that game was an anomaly for him. Mm -hmm. um, but from that game on, as I've said, you know, I felt like he's played winning football for us. Uh, you know, when we, we're not successful, very few times can I put on the tape and say it's because of our quarterback. Um, you know, not that he's absolved of playing, he hasn't played perfect, no. Um, but I also think, you know, when you look at the tape and you guys asked about the interception, for instance, in this last game, I mean, we had a turnover in the red zone on a fumble, the snap was high, and then we had a turnover in the red zone there with the interception. And as I said before, you know, perception isn't always reality because, you know, if Daryl continues to go through the, the area where the ball is being delivered and not settled, um, and then, you know, when you look at oh, the quarterback threw an interception, well, when you study it and you know ball, that there's a lot of things that go into it. So uh, I really think the kid's one of the better quarterbacks in our league. I think, uh, you know, he's only going to get better and better. He's a redshirt sophomore. He's played, started 10 games for us here, as you said, or, or alluded to here. Uh, you know, as I said, when, when we lose, it's not because our quarterback isn't playing at a high level. It's because we all, including us as coaches, and I talked about that a lot this week, that this accountability piece is on us as coaches too. It's not always the player's execution. It's us being in the right defense or the right offensive calls or me making the right decision and game management and, and who we need to have in the game. And that's the decisions I've got to be made, that I've got to make uh, the right decisions. So this thing is enough to spread for everybody to take a, a blame when we lose and when we have success. So that's part of the job, but I really, I really like our quarterback. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Thanks.